um, that this is a safe, supportive space. Sometimes feelings may get invoked when you're here and it's okay. We have people here to assist you. We also have a comfort suite right down the hall. So if you need to excuse yourself, please feel free to do so. Um, also just know uh, if you want to use the Whova app, please try not to, if you're in person, but online, please continue to do so. That is where you'll get a lot of information and that also includes your survey. So there's a couple ways you can do your surveys. We have the barcodes on the door. One is for CEUs and one is just for the regular session. And then, or you can take it through the Whova app. So now we get to introduce the lovely presenter. And for those of you who do not know Elliot, I have known him a little bit, so I've known him just, just a little bit, but super excited to introduce him. One, um, some of his experience, and you'll see some of this in the, in the bio, but uh, he has a lifelong, lifelong experience with bipolar 2 disorder, ADHD, and opioid addiction. But again, he is not all those diagnoses. He's so much more than that. He's also a certified mental health and recovery peer support specialist, woo, woo, woo. all about peer support. And then he is an empathetic communication system specialist. That is new to me. So I'm glad he's gonna talk a little bit about that today. And then his work with youth and young adult population is informed by his formative experience with childhood trauma and the success he has been able to achieve in his recovery. His efforts as a mentor, educator, curriculum writer, and the work that he does with the D. Wood Foundation won grants from the city of Austin He's also helped create peer support programs for historically black colleges and universities. Um, and he's got many awards as well from the United States Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. So welcome Elliot. And I also wanna give a shout out to his mother who was sitting there in the audience that came all the way from Philadelphia to help support him. Oh, hello there, audience. I am recording this about an hour before the presentation is supposed to begin, which is now, I guess, beginning. This last seven days have been a wreck. The power outage in Austin, the winter storm, all that good stuff, left me without power for a solid five to six days. During that time, lack of sleep, freezing cold, and I'm so thankful for the people in my life that which is there for me. Oh, and so the pressure of all of that, the non-sleep, the lack of my meds being able to work because of it, needing to get fast food every single day and the financial burden that has on somebody, you know? It's a lot. And whew, And we're in a very powerful conference right now full of very powerful people and messages. And we have been talking about just suicide, something ferocious, you know? And it's beautiful. And it triggers the hell out of me. And it's not just that, it's more so the intensity of the conversation around suicide. Because for the messaging that I'm hearing, the love and concern, the desire for our children to be strong and resilient and, and recognize that they do have it within themselves to be themselves confidently and proudly. And it also is triggering. Hearing people talk about suicide like there's some kind of war on it. Wow. We love each other that much. When we love somebody, we go to war for them. We get that feeling of, mm -mm, nope, I will not allow this to happen to someone that I have such dear feelings for because they earned it just by being them. And I just also want to make sure you recognize that that shit is triggering. It hurts. So I'm making the decision to uh, stop just emceeing for a little bit and just <sighs> just 
remember that all these feelings make sense. Every single one of them makes sense. I was having suicidal ideation just last week or the week before. And it's okay. Because when you have two attempts under your belt, actually technically three, I just happened to not win through on the third one. Uh, that doesn't leave me. It's never going to leave me. The idea of getting over something or moving past, not so much. And instead, I like to think about it as I'm going to grow from it. Hell, I already am, you know? And so that's something I'll talk about in just a bit as we get through this and we get into the whole programming and what it's going to do and what it is doing and the beauty that is going to manifest. And right now, I'm just going to sit in this presentation room and be. I'm going to step back from every single responsibility of an MC because moving the crowd right now is nowhere even near second to the importance of this program and the, the effect it is having hell on me, let alone the world around me that needs youth and young adult peer supporters who are certified, who are specialized, and who know exactly what they need to do to take care of themselves because they are the model. All right. It is ooh, so important for me to watch that because the whole empathy thing, right? If I can break down how I am feeling inside, if I can figure out exactly what the last, whatever 24 hours times six is, and I'm not even gonna pretend like I can do that in my head. If I can think back and do that, then that means I can come up with the solution to the puzzle that is why I needed to sit in this corner and just cry and babble to myself. Didn't matter who was in the room, I just needed to do it because everything makes sense. And that's my favorite part about the whole empathetic, excuse me, <clears throat> whew, empathetic communication system specialist is because we have to genuinely listen to ourselves before we can listen to anybody else. If we do not understand what we're feeling, if we do not understand how to put our own mask on, then I try putting that mask on somebody else and I'm gonna probably hurt or I'm gonna put it on nowhere near as good or as secure as I have for myself first and then can now pass on to them. And so I'm going to, instead of apologize, I'm not doing anything wrong, right? Like I'm, I'm not messing up anybody's day. I'm loving life right now. So I might eh, go kind of mess up on some slides. I might over speak. I might do a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't mean that you all hate me. And this is the conversation that I'm having in my head. So I want you all to get to know me a little bit better. I always go by now over the last year or so, Elliot Philip Nyblack. I do that to honor my mother and my father's side of the family. My mother right there in the center and right back there. Uh, <laughs> so my maternal grandfather's name is Philip, whereas my dad, right? Last name Nye Black. However, well, I'll let y'all find out something new in just a little bit. But those two people are so important to me that I can't exist without both sides of my family. I understand we got the legacy, you know, the lady's got to take my name and blah, blah, blah. And no, that's for me means nothing. For me, blood means nothing. For me, the name means nothing except for the memories behind it and what it inspires me to do. So my middle and last name inspires every single piece of accomplishment in history that that awesome person back there and that awesome dude up there put into me. And so I'm starting off with this whole honorifics thing just to get it out the way. Because before 
the state said that we could bill Medicaid to help each other just by being someone with lived experience, nah, you know, we didn't need this. But I am a certified mental health and recovery peer specialist. That means I have a lived experience with mental health, uh, some kind of mental health or non-typical neurology. Similarly so with uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Similarly so with my uh, opioid addiction in my past. And then lastly, this empathetic communication system specialist is again, just really the, the culmination of everything I had to internalize to even be a peer specialist. I just try to make it a little bit more clear now. Empathetic communication is basically the idea that every single person in the world who's ever been born uses empathy every day. And we have this narrative now of empathy that is, I guess, all nice and positive and rainbows and sunshine. And if we just had empathy for each other, we'd all hug and we'd be best friends. And that is us loading the word empathy with what we would like it to mean. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that empathy is simply stepping in somebody else's shoes for just a moment. And so if I can do that and I can know what they're saying without them even saying it, then I know how to, how to act with them. And if I wanna be a predatory bank lender, giving out loans for individuals who cannot afford getting them back, I know what it feels like to be scared. I know what it feels like to have a family that needs me. I can understand the sadness that comes with maybe losing a place, even if I haven't experienced it. And so I know that person right there, they need this house because they're afraid. Empathy. And so I say this very like, evil sounding uh, description because I just want to get the narrative changed and get that conversation going. Because empathetic communication is all about non-judgment. It's about identity affirmation. And what that looks like is, well, I am who I am. And I can trust myself to be who I am. Inter and intrapersonal, that all regards about like how I talk with you all. But the intra, the inside me, I need to know how I'm talking to myself. Am I being mean to myself? Do I like myself? Whole bunch of stuff. Those uh, color-coded language words there, they all have something to do with how we either accept, deny, or actively straight up just kick out the way. The feelings that we have inside first. And so all of these, I believe, can lead to some magic because they did for me. And so to give you an idea about my, I guess my past or my qualifications, firstly, currently I am the Chief Equity and Education Officer for the D. Wood Foundation. Uh, that also goes in regard to Director of Peer Support Services. I have always been an educator, always have been, always will be. Curriculum writer, both uh, within the education system and the peer system, as well as opening and having my own private peer support practice, Reality by Design. I can make my reality whatever it is that I want it because no one lives my reality except for me. It's relatively simple, right? I'm also affiliated with a whole bunch of amazing people and organizations. Uh, Austin Mental Health Community, where I am a mental health uh, crisis peer specialist. I go into hospitals. Uh, I meet people where they might need to be. It could be in a, look, it could be in a, in a restaurant. It could be behind a, uh, I would even say, what's the weirdest place I've been? The weirdest place I've ever been was in a Walmart dressing, that like the little dressing area, right in the dead center, where it just kind of is like, oh, I hope no one's watching me and thinking I'm stealing something, right? And I had a conversation there with someone who was just passed out in the corner. They were so just filled with grief that they could not leave and they were afraid that someone was going to arrest them for being crazy. And so I got to go in there and just say, hey, you know, if it's two of us over here crying, then I guess we're okay. They'll just kind of leave us alone. DBSA, Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. Uh, I do support groups for the Black community with those. And so I am always wanting to spread that information. Uh, with Via Hope, I'm now sitting on the board of directors. So now we are 50% people with lived experience. The biggest, real talk, only almost, peer support service and uh, certification entity in Texas. And then with SAMHSA, 
Uh, not only was I able to get an award for this program I'm about to show you, but also I'm now sitting on the peer leadership advisory group because there are some very serious reforms needed within the peer support space before something dangerous happens. And I know this all sounds very scary and I promise you that you're gonna have at least a little bit of a smile. Not yet though, because yeah, you see that word up there, bipolar type two, tension deficit hyperactivity disorder, PTSD, opioid abuse, suicide survivor. I like the little 2.5 there, I guess feels like a non even number. And then, dissociative amnesia, and that's where the fun comes in. Philly, I'm just gonna leave this here just for a moment. I see, you know, everybody's just kind of getting a little vein popping out of their head. All right, we're good, we're good. All right, go gritty. Born and raised, I swear to you, I'm gonna hear at least one Will Smith reference after this, right? Don't pretend like you're not gonna do it. And this is me in eighth grade. I think I was what, 14? Mom, I was like 14, right? Yeah. So I am the, let's see. I am the little rounded head thing in the back corner over here. And then on this picture, I have just decided to sit right in the worst sunlight possible so I can maybe fade away. This was from our class trip to New York City, go to the Statue of Liberty, all that good stuff. And two years before this, I woke up one day when I was 12 years old, no memories whatsoever. I didn't know my name. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who that amazing woman over there is. I didn't know basically anything. I knew how to read, walk, talk, all the basic concepts, language. But outside of that, memories, mm, not so much. Because it happened at the end of the school year, I, well, I wasn't in school. I got to go to a brand new summer camp. I got to just practice being with people. I could listen to the radio. I could look at photo albums. I could do all the things to pretend and I could practice with new people. But when you get back to school, that practice doesn't really mean all that much. Before I could ever internalize my Philly self, I needed to learn who I was. And so you got the little Jersey, uh, the Green Bay joint right there. You have the Tommy Hill. Wow, what was I doing? Look at the color combination here. I thought I was the magnificent thing ever. Like, look at me, it's, it's just beautiful. And I had this like thing with my finger, just I'm quiet because I'm thoughtful. And that was the summer camp that eventually let me understand how much I love working with kids so that they do not feel the way I did when I was growing up. College me, yay. College was around the time I started wearing glasses because I just wanted to hide my face for whatever reason. I felt kind of ashamed. I don't know, I just didn't want people to know me and my first car. I loved that car, that, that, that's 90 Civic manual got me everywhere and that was i think right before i drove it to college for the first time i think my sophomore year and the very next year was my first suicide attempt i needed to leave school uh right after then you know i had to skip a year and then i went back a second time made it through my i guess super sophomore year before the next year an attempt number two came and then after that attempt number three that turned out to be 2.5, that, that was the game changer. Because once I started going to a different doctor and asking different questions, I started remembering how much I love working with kids. So why not do an after-school program, right? I like stickers, they stick to my forehead. Like this, I got three, they only have two. I'm bigger and better, yeah, right? And these little boys, they taught me so much about just being myself. And when it felt so right, it was, I gotta be a teacher. I have to. And so I did. Uh, these are my fifth grade students after getting either, oh yeah, this is eighth grade graduation with my little man, Willie. And then this is Bianca. She was in high school when I went back to visit, having gone back home from uh, Austin, back to Philly. And then this group of kids right here, my second fifth grade class. I got into such a negative, dangerous place with my mental health 
that I had to leave them about two months into the school year. It was by far the toughest thing I've ever had to do. And I'm so thankful that I could write notes to each of them and just like put them in their desks because I didn't announce it, I just left. I just gave my principal a resignation and said nothing, just walked out. And I found out that about 10 years later, some of them kept the notes and I couldn't find them to put them in this presentation, but it was just like, see, I'm on to something. High school, and this is me actually now during my high school time with the little worm sticking out my head. Oh, I got to teach in Hardy William High School back in Philly. And I, I mean, look at them. They're my little family. And it was such a shame that after that year, I got so depressed that I had an accident at the gym from not sleeping and broke my spine. Couldn't walk for months, nothing but pain. I was passing out just because my uh, meds fell underneath the sofa and I couldn't bend down to get them. And all of that, when I got my legs back, I just said, this is nonsense. I am so tired of feeling this way. I'm so tired of doing what everybody says. And then I realized I was tired of doing what I perceived everybody saying. And so now it was time to just say, sell all my stuff, put whatever I needed into her basement and just drive. I had nowhere to go. I just said, I'm gonna drive left. I started at Nashville and just said, wherever I go, someone will tell me where to be and I'll go. And somehow three months later, I ended up here. And I resumed the teaching. I started teaching inclusion pre-kindergarten. Mm, that, was, that was something special because I never thought I would do that. I never teach the pre-K and they taught me so much. And they also taught me that my administration and my fellow teachers, as much as they may love me and want to do the work, they can cause some pain. They can cause some serious pain. And so when I started thinking about killing myself a fourth time, I knew I had to jet before it became a reality. And so instead, now I, well, I started going into schools and teaching black history in the perspective of black history is American history. I believe that black history, and I can legitimately show every single thing that has happened to us as a community has been copied. Every single minority in this country, everything they're going through, we have experienced, and therefore we have the ability to have empathy with anybody. I then became a uh, mental health and recovery peer specialist, same with the whole ECSS. I'm not saying that entire thing out loud again. And this is via the Hey Peers platform as an online uh, source for anything regarding peer support, support groups, individual counselors, uh, curriculum writing, everything. One-stop shop for just getting this and this kind of aligned. And so now after all of that, after all the hardship and then the success, the Wood Foundation and our near age peer support program, because we deserve so much more than we are being told we are allowed to have. And so before we do anything else, I just wanna read our mission statement that the D Wood Foundation's mission is to enhance awareness and advocate for mental health reform and suicide prevention in minority communities. I don't think I need to say any bit more about why this speaks to me so much. The objective of this program, very simple. Just we want to make sure that we can provide person to person, real talk, situationally dependent peer support for people who are of the same age. And I'm using that term near age and same age for a reason, especially with black colleges and universities, as well as traditional spaces. Because we can create, I believe it, hell, I know it that we can create a nation of just nothing but the most amazing support that we've ever felt. And it won't matter color, creed, nothing. It will still matter that we identify as whatever we do. We can identify with something and love ourselves and still love other people as well. And so the outcomes that we're looking to achieve is, well, first, retention. We drop out 
of so many colleges. I dropped out four times before I finally graduated and got my education degree. Whoa, that was, I ain't gonna lie, it was kind of fun. I got to go to Costa Rica for a little bit for a Spanish thing. I took Spanish one and I found out that I was actually okay with it. We wanna see that academic achievement that I got to feel knowing what I wanted to do with my life. Finally know it and having some kind of sense that I could do it. I had my idea about what will this do within, uh, within regard to diversity? Well, guess what? We make up about, I think like 5%, somewhere between five and 11% of mental health professionals. And that's nowhere near enough at all. And so the partner with us to get this going, we have UT Dell Medical School and their Amplify Clinic heading out of uh, Austin Community College within the form communities. Well, they are our partners within getting our youth certified because it is a process and we do need that. And we also need to know that there's something more to it. And the more is all of our other partners because peer support, if it's just us coming into conference rooms, if it's just us talking about this negative feeling bad space, well, how about jobs? How about the why and our physical health? How about just, Anything that does with music at the Sims Foundation, that is how we get to each other. That is how we start making genuine connections. And so tomorrow, mm -hmm, we're grand opening. Now, this is the Amplify Clinic, so it's not our services just yet, but you'll learn a bit more about that in just a moment. Because every single thing that we do is backed by data and data that we collect from our community from our events. So not from a mental health conference where everybody's just like, I'm not even going to that because I'm 19 years old and I have so much better to do. We have concerts, we have carnivals, we have people come out for raffles. And when you're happy and having a good time, you'll be honest about your mental health. And this is what we found. And we identified that within the Houston Tillotson University, all of this depression, that feeling of isolation, suicidal thoughts, that's a big deal. And so now we have the direct numbers and we do this survey within any school. So we're not taking national data. No, we're taking local because every community is different. There is no black monolith. There's no one who can tell me what it means to be a black person. So how can I go to every single school and treat them like they are the same people? That's me dissing my own people. The numbers that I was referring to, we are hurting. We're hurting something fierce. Five point, what was that? 5.08% just within the racial demographic by age. And this is where that near age comes in, right? About 45. But somehow our youth are the ones who are removing themselves from our lives. So how can someone who has made it through that passage of life it's not that they can't understand, it's just that how can they reach if they don't have the language of the context? They can still help, and yet we need more. And now this is where the peer support part comes in. We have that concept of the, of the medical model of disability and the social model. In general, the medical model says that, yep, your fault. You're sick, you're tired, you're depressed, you wanna kill yourself, you wanna run away from home, you wanna hurt somebody, you wanna do drugs, you wanna do whatever. Well, it's your own fault. And you better listen to that doctor. You better listen to that professional because they know the answer. They'll give you the pill that'll solve everything. And as long as you do what they say, no matter what you feel, you'll be okay. Social model flips that. Social model says that there's nothing wrong with me, but what's going on with the world around me? Why am I getting looked at funny when all y'all need to do is put a ramp? Why am I getting looked at funny when maybe I just need an extra mental health day or just maybe some extra PTO? And is it extra if the work is getting done even better because I'm healthy? And so right now with the Texas State Certification of Peer Support Specialist, they have some genuine, right, real talk, good criteria at first. So to be a mental health peer support specialist, you need to have a statement of lived experience in recovery, meaning that I sign on a piece of paper that I attest to having 
a history of difficulty within whatever area, and then that I am doing my best and I'm staying on track and I'm making recovery progress. You need a high school diploma or a GED, real talk, that can be a barrier to many people. The criminal history background check, yeah. Then you have your core and your MHPS training, which I mean standard, right? We get trained for things and we need that. And you have to have at least 250 hours of field in-person experience to be able to be given this. And it sounds great. And I'm gonna tell you right now, it leads to this. And there actually is a black Superman now. It's really amazing, All right? And this is dangerous. This is a superhero complex. A superhero complex states that the people we are trying to serve, they can't do it themselves. Nope, they need somebody to come in and save them. I got 250 field hours. I have, I have my training. I have my certification. I can now fix everybody. I thought that, and I broke myself because of it, just as being a teacher. Because the things I saw in the public education system that I now see 100% like in the peer system, we are going to hurt each other someday and it's going to be bad. And we don't want to do that. It's just that we're in this rush to help each other that we're forgetting we need practice and genuine reflection and guidance because we don't need to save anybody. We are taking care of ourselves. We are the models. And that recovery model, I wanna read it, a process of change through which individuals improve their health and wellness, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. So if I am recovering and I am doing that process for me, how can I tell somebody else how to do it for them? How can I use, you have to do this? No, you don't. I did this and it worked for me, big difference. And now I get to get to the good part. Our peer support specialist. Just, just, I'm just gonna stare for a hot second because these are amazing youth, young adults and near age peers. And I'm gonna get back again to that near age, but I wanna introduce you to my boy, Brandon. Brandon is over at HT right now. And the man has some serious dreams. And I'm gonna make sure if anyone ever still needs his Instagram app information, just please hit me up because he is doing just superly uplifting work, you know, just giving our community what we deserve, a chance to believe in ourselves. Now we are working with forum communities and that's where we get that partnership for the uh, certification process. Our enhanced MHPS session, where we bring in students to become mental health peer specialists, who wants to be trained to do something and not get paid? I can't do that. That's a barrier to entry. So let's make sure that even before they get certified, they can afford to take the training and begin getting the hours. Let's make sure that they can eat as well as get this job done. And after they get that certification, well, the enhanced part, now is that stepping things up a bit. Now it's okay. How are you doing this? What are you doing? How are you doing it for yourself? How are you modeling it? And that's why we increase the stipend, <clears throat> excuse me. Oh, and you know what? Funny thing about this, that stipend right there is wrong. It should be $7,500. There's no way I'm gonna let somebody work for all that long time without getting financially stable. Now, our program culture, direct reflection of that need for independence from the state telling us that we are doing it the correct way. It's not to disrespect the system, it's to say we exist outside of it and within it. We are 100% peer operated. There is nobody without some kind of experience in this making it happen. We are models, not experts. I can't tell anybody what to do, but I can sure say what worked for me. And I can show it through my actions and the way I'm living my life. I am advocating the meaningful engagement, meaning that the parties, the concerts, the carnivals, the listening, the meetings, everything 
comes back from the community and the ongoing education, that's gonna be, well, you know what? We're gonna find out that in a minute too. So for us and for this program, instead of just having to write a picture, I'm sorry, write a letter, signing it and saying, oh, you know, I got this mental health thing, I'm cool. Nope, I need some proof. I need some proof because I have now come across so many individuals who they're not doing anything wrong. I don't wanna say they're doing something evil. It's just, it's very simple right now to become a peer specialist. And that means everybody can do it. Oh yeah, teachers. There's a factory farm pumping out teachers and we've seen how that's been going. Ongoing, right? And sustained recovery, that's the key, sustained. I could have a great week and then I can have a hell of a year. Just because I can keep my stuff together for a week does not make me ready to do this, but it does give me the, the insight that I can. Just need some more guidance. We focus on an internal self-care model that put the, uh, your gas mask on. Oh, that sounds horrible. And put your uh, air mask on before anybody else, right? And we utilize empathetic communication, 100%. I'm not even perfect at it. I am always practicing. But the idea that I can respect you as individuals without having to tell you what to do, that means I can respect myself. And so the process works something like this. When we have our students come in, they're not just students and they're not just interns, they are employees. These are paid individuals who are valued and given the education they need and the support that they deserve. Once we employ them, they go through their uh, certification training. They complete that, then they can go on either to the top tier, right, where they continue their employment with the foundation, uh, as well as continuing to receive academic support because they're in school serving their community. If an individual within an HBCU or a community college decides that eh, I'm done, well, they will still get that continued employment and support. And if they want to take it even further, well, and they just want to drop out, guess what? You still have the community there for you. We never leave anybody just because maybe they can't handle it in that moment. Everybody is welcome back. Yeah, All right. just that's, tell me that's not adorable, right? Like, look at that five head there too. It's, whew, teeth blinding. And so this is now where that Jones Nyblack comes in. Phyllis Louise Jones, Lewis Elliott Nyblack. My even my first name is my legacy. And on my mother's side, that's where the history of attention disorders is at. That's the ADHD. That's the, uh, the I gotta just hoard everything. On my dad's side, that's the schizophrenia. That's my bipolar type two. My legacy focuses on this because if I deny any part of this, I'm hurting myself and I'm disrespecting myself. Why would I do that? And that's how I developed the Jones Nye Black Peer Support Framework. Every single thing I do, every curriculum I write, every program I run, every support group I do, all revolves around this. So in our center is our peer. That's the individual who's receiving the support, who needs, the, needs that guidance to help guide themselves. The PS is for our peer specialists. So someone like myself or the people who we are now certified, they're specialists. Like we said, though, they're models. After them, we have our support partners. Support partners are those individuals who they could be a larger organization. They could be an individual with a small business. Regardless, they are now supporting the peer by proxy. They could be giving uh, supplies to the peer support specialist. They could be giving something to the leadership team because our peer leaders are now also a big force within this peer's life. And then lastly, the community. Everything circles around the peer, everything. And what's important is to remember that we are all peers. Even as a peer support specialist, I'm a peer. I am the most important thing in there. I have the most important resource in the world, my time. Nobody can give it to me back. Nobody, I can't go get it back. There's no way. And so whatever I choose to spend my time on is the most important thing in the world. And if I choose to spend that time on helping someone, then that person is the most important person in the world. 
we can value one another in equal measure and still say, I'm number one. That's the only way that I can recognize someone else as number one. Our service structure looks something like this. We have our top, our coordinator. Uh, that is the person who is just running through all the daily operations, the individuals who are making the networking, talking with the schools. Our peer support navigators and supervisors, they are the ones who are actually now within the process of supporting those who are being trained. The navigators go around the schools, they go within the community and they find out what the needs are. They do lessons within classrooms. They might do community engagement, uh, surveys. The, uh, the supervisors, uh, they check in once a week. And that check-in is more than just, hey, how you doing? Feeling good? All right, you help somebody? Cool, here's 10 hours from your week. Nah. Mm -mm. Our supervisors actually talk and listen and observe. Because even if you're doing 20 hours of work, we just wanna make sure it's quality. It's not to make anybody scared of anything. It's not to say you can't get this. No, it's just to say, we want you to be focused. And I have the absolute belief that we all are. Our services include helping uh, students within the campus communities to locate resources they need for success. It could be academic, it could be, it could be financial, it could be something in between, doesn't matter. It could be clothing, it could be a place to sleep for a night. All of our support groups are hybrid. So if you need support and you might be out in a rural area, if you can get a signal with your phone, you can get some support, one-to-one -one or in a group. We have our wellness classes, community events, practical empowerment, which is kind of my favorite, and the ongoing and education support, uh, that's along the lines of, well, I need to graduate, I need some help, someone help me. Our active engagement, we do some active engagement. All of these are flaggers for our You Are Not Alone uh, fellowship, 100% student run, 100% student engagement. They love getting together and talking about how to help each other. We have our YNA week. We have just, oh. and of course, you know, I'm getting kind of emotional now. Oh. And this is my desk. Yeah. This is where those empowerment classes come in because my brain is all over the place. So when I have an issue and I can't focus and I'm not getting my things in on time, I look at my situation, I say, what's going on here? How can I best make myself work to my ability? Well, get a whole bunch of screens. <laughs> All right. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. Uh, that let me work in such a more just focused and productive way. And three weeks later, I had to change it again because I have a diagnosis of ADHD and I get bored real quick. So, well, well, how about just not make a home studio? Why not, All right? And I did this, uh, this first one, just because I wanted to start producing and someone told me that I had to buy $100 this and $500 this and it's like, no, I don't. I have a webcam and a thing I put my feet on when I sit down, I can make it work. I don't need billions of dollars to make change happen. And so imagine how many lives we could change if we just taught each other how to critically think and create solutions to the things that mean the most to us. Instead of letting society limit us, and I'm gonna rephrase that, instead of allowing ourselves to be limited by society, we take control and personal responsibility. Continuing education, uh, continuing education units, how we keep our credentials going forward. Uh -uh. And it's not that they're not important, it's that I can't train somebody to help somebody. I train someone to make something. I train someone to put together a puzzle, or I'm sorry, a, a piece of machinery. I train somebody to stock shelves a certain way. There's a guaranteed outcome that looks like success. When I think about us, we are puzzles. And puzzles, sometimes they have more than one answer, you know? And they take some time and effort to look into, and every single one of them is different, even if you might be familiar with some parts. Oh, and unfortunately, this was a little bit of an error, but the third picture that's supposed to be on there is of wellness, of self-centeredness. 
taking care of ourselves and our needs first. Because when it comes down to that educated empathy, that empathetic communication, the ability to say, oh, I hear you, and now how am I responding? Am I affirming what you're sharing with me? Am I affirming your feelings? Am I saying, yo, I hear you? I don't know specifically, but I feel you. I can't tell you what to do, but I can tell you what I did. Empathy does that. And I genuinely believe that you can combine empathy with logic. They're not separate things. Everything is going on up here, meaning that everything is there at once. And that means everything is affecting the other. Like I said, I can think back to my own trauma with suicide. I can think and figure out that I'm hearing a bunch of suicide messaging. I'm remembering all of that and I'm hungry and I'm tired and my meds aren't working and my mom's here. So I want to get super hype and happy, but I can't because I don't have the energy and it's cold outside and so on and so forth. Everything I feel makes sense. So if we could just figure out how we feel and why we feel it, and if we can teach ourselves to do it younger before we start getting idealized in this, oh, I can't do that. Emotions don't make any sense. I don't want to be illogical. It's like, come on now. Because if I flip it, it becomes, I'm sorry, if I flip it from, what was it? Oh yeah, be a man, you know, just, just grow up. Don't cry. You don't do that. Suck it in, suck it in. Well, I can, I can change that real quick. Ready? Be a man and cry. Why are you so scared of crying? Why? Why are you so angry about someone thinking anything about you? Why do you hate your feelings so much? Show them. Are you ashamed of your feelings? Do you feel bad about that? So imagine if we started talking forcefully about the power of crying, right? What if we change the language? That is what I want to do. Because out of all these programs, out of all the curriculums, all right, out of all the things that I do and talk and say, I'm changing the language that we use when we talk about empathy and when we talk about mental health. I am done with us always approaching mental health from a space of something bad's going to happen. Because that's how we're treating ourselves and our youth and young adults right now. We're thinking they're going to kill themselves if we don't do something right now. They're going to get online, they're gonna do some horrible things. Education world, we call that uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy. When we approach a person and say they're going to do something and we're gonna make sure they don't, well, that's like me being told one of my students is uh, just so rowdy, he can't learn, he hates this, he's gonna do this. I start treating them like that before I even meet them. And then I think about them like that when I don't even see them. So imagine if we started saying, what do we want them to do? What do we want them to believe and feel? And then we take another step back and say, what do we want them to be able to do for themselves? Self-identify. They can come up with the solutions for themselves. I somehow did. I just definitely had the benefit of being in a forced situation where I had to legit practice people. And the way I did that was talking to myself. I talk to myself all the time. You can ask my man, Victor, in the back. When I was up here crying, just taking my time, I was still chatting because I know that if I can talk to myself, I can figure out my problems. I can say, Elliot, all right, you didn't get the food last night. Uh, that person had a really ugly sweater and it's upsetting me so much. And you know, I can do, I didn't get to pet my cat. I can do all of that. I can figure out the little pieces and I make sense. So for me, Everybody makes sense. There's not a single decision people can make that does not make sense, that cannot be traced back to something. Even if it's just being kind of hungry and in a classroom and unable to sit still and fidget and be told you can't learn. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, to wrap this up, please visit our website at uh, dwoodfoundation.org. You'll find more information there about our programs. You'll find more information about our educated empathy training. And on the bottom, reality by design, on my end, that is my wish and desire for the world to just treat each other a little bit more kindness and understanding. And I love people. Y'all are really cool. Let's please keep being you because you can make your own reality. And I also want to stop for a second and say, mom, I told you that I had a surprise for you. Uh -huh. So I think it was last year 
uh, or the year before I did a presentation about youth and how we can advocate for our children in schools. And so I video chatted her to ask her questions about my childhood and what she experienced. And the one question that I wanted to say for this was what can parents do or what can you tell parents? And by parents, I mean guardians as well. What would you tell them when they're experiencing some kind of difficulty? So yeah, I'll let her speak for herself now. The advice I would give to myself is you love your children and you always want the best for your children. But sometimes you're going to have to do a little more and admit that there is a problem. And there are some problems that can be addressed if you accept them for what they are. It's no more different than if my child had chicken pox and I had to give him Tylenol for the fever, if he broke his leg and I had to take him to the doctor and they put a cast on it. It is something that is there and it is something that can be, if admitted, that can be worked at. She's right. It worked out apparently, so good decisions. Yeah, I'm not gonna be the only one here crying. There's an eye black, have fun, go for it. Just So now as the actual end, I'm just going to leave this up here for anyone who needs any of this information. And I wanted this to not be some gigantically long presentation because I, it's not that I want you to ask questions. I'd actually like to ask y'all questions because that's another part of this program. Like, why should I be the one telling you all what needs to be done? Why don't I ask you all what your experiences have been, what your thoughts are, because that is now going to give me more information on how to reach more people. I cannot assume that a gigantic study is gonna be the perfect one for my little school, but I can use that big study to inform my decisions going forward. And so it's all equally valid. So I just wanna take a moment and ask you all your thoughts. Empathy, uh, thoughts on what you are seeing or feeling, questions about what children might be experiencing, or how about y'all? What did you all experience as youth? What are you experiencing right now as a youth or adult? Or how about just a person? Silence is not a bad thing. So I'm gonna just take a step back. I'm gonna stand here. And when anybody wants to speak, oh, by the way, she sent me to a Quaker school and we were taught uh, every Wednesday, we would just go to a meeting for worship house. We would sit there 45 minutes straight through, no talking. And if somebody felt like they wanted to say something, uh, they would stand up, they would say it, and they'd sit back down and no one would say a word. Because if you felt it, that's all that mattered. And you want to share it, that's all that mattered. It could be, I saw a pretty butterfly or, I lost my uncle, or I saw something horrible or beautiful. Nah, doesn't matter. So yeah, please, don't feel pressure. Life is still good. So if you know of a person that is suffering from a diagnosis of schizophrenia and they do, um, and, and, they, and they do not wanna take medication, they do not think they have a problem, they um, do, and parents are not, I guess, equipped to know exactly what to do or how to help in that situation, um, what would you recommend in talking to that person and providing resources to that person? How would you approach it from that empathy level um, and helping them? That is a beautiful question. 
And I am now going to ask you all, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about just needing those resources and reaching out and feeling those things? Uh, Elliot, from personal experience, your stepbrother was a schizo. Mm -hmm. And we spent years with calls from hospitals and calls from police stations and calls from neighbors. And you get up and you go and you're there, you support, you, you, you bring them home, you, you go to the hospital, you go to the clinics where they are. They go in and out and in and out. And it is work on you. It stresses you. It stresses you to the point that you begin to think, why am I always the one? Because you're always going to be the one that you're going to get the call. But then after a while, you get tired, you get stressed, you get angry, you get angry at them. You hate them. You don't want to be a by them. You don't want to even admit that you know them. And when you have to get to that point, then you have to know you need to step back and you need to give yourself a breath of fresh air. You need to breathe in, think about what's going on because their problem is something that they can't help. And if you can't help, you can only be there to be supportive. And like they say, you need to put the mask on yourself first and then you put the mask on others. So you step back, you take a breath, you leave it alone because what's gonna happen is gonna happen anyway. And then when you're back into the game again, then you get up, you put your big boy panties on, your big girl draws on, and then you just work with them again. It's a vicious cycle. But until that cycle changed, until they're able to see their problem, you need to not be a problem to yourself and to them. You need to support yourself because the strength in you Will eventually work to the strength in them. So I want to thank you so much. And before we move on, quick question. Do I have a child with schizophrenia? No. I don't, right? So when you say, yeah, you have to do this, you have to do that. Are you talking about me? I have to do that? I, I, I'm just a genuine no, question. Not, not just not you specifically, mm -hmm. but in general, when you have a child or a close relative, yes, you are that responsible person and you become that responsible person to them because you have to think about it. You know, they might be schizoid, but they always know who to reach out to, who's there for them, mm -hmm. who's the strength that they can call on. There's always that one person. And you get to be that one person just by who you are, just by knowing, and they know that you're empathetic, that you're there to support them. They might not realize how much is a strain on you, but yes. So here's what I want to offer you. Imagine changing that you to an I. Imagine saying, I had to put my big girl draws on. I had to put my big boy panties on. I had to be the person who they reach out to. Because when we use that word I, when responding to somebody's advice or request for, for help, now I'm being genuine. I'm not pretending like I know what everybody else is going through. I'm talking about just me. I'm respecting my experience. I'm respecting the other person by telling them, I can't tell you what to do. I can't answer that question with any kind of definitive answer. We're not math problems. We're not. We are puzzles. We're coloring books. So for me, I have a difficult time believing in solutions to people feeling bad. I do have a belief in our ability to critically think and depending on the situation, find uh, something that allows us to move forward with confidence. And I can only do that if when I'm thinking about other people's requests, I know I'm thinking about myself. My time is the most important in the world. And so my experiences are. So when I share them, I'm going to share my experiences. So, and I yeah. also know that comes from a space of love. So yeah, all's good. Good. Thank you. 
Um, I'm not sure, but I was going to try to like uh, give you some hope with that, uh, not to necessarily answer the question, but one thing I know is that, um, you know, when we have family members um, that are suffering from some sort of mental illness, whatever, however it is, uh, sometimes we have to, or I, <laughs> Sometimes I have had to just hold space for those individuals, be there for them, uh, gather those resources. You know, sometimes uh, even with family members, it's, it, especially in the African-American uh, culture, like we didn't know about uh, mental illness. And, and you know, and, and if, it, if it's an older parent, like, you know, we didn't speak about it. So it's about edu educating, just putting the, giving them the information and allowing them to read it, receive it for themselves. Um, and then just holding space. Sometimes we just got to hold space for individuals until they get to that place where they have accepted who they are, what's going on with them. Well, they, in even the point where they have educated themselves enough to say, okay, you know what? I got a problem or, you know, this looks like me. This sounds like me. And then they become, and until they become actually ready to like reach out and say, you know what, I need some help. You know, we just hold space for them. We, we, we stand in the, in the gap and call it standing in the gap, we stand in the gap for them until they're ready. And we pray that, you know, that they get to that place where they are ready. That's what I have. And so one, one, two, I guess. So I just want to put this out there too, right? That when you questioned yourself with that word, we and I, we is exactly the same thing as I in many ways, right? Because we can be a community. I can talk about the community that I'm in and I'm, you know, I, I love, I can say that we have been through so much. We will get through this. We will work hard together. We will accomplish this. And it feels damn good to say, don't it? So I'm now considering both myself and my community who I now directly know. We is still ownership language. It identifies that we are in a community. So hell yeah, we. Another question? Yes, I have a question. My name is Erica and I'm with Communities for Recovery, but I am a mom of uh, an individual who has um, lived experience with uh, both mental health and substance use challenges. And um, my question is about the D. Wood Foundation and um, the program that you have, because he has expressed um, interest in possibly becoming a peer support, support specialist. And so my question is, does he have to be at going to school, either ACC or uh, Houston Tillotson um, to be accepted into that program? Because he does not plan to go to college, but we are gonna get it through high school. So, so, I mean, A, thank you for believing in this just for me speaking about it, it means a lot. And that's where that near age comes in. This has nothing to do, this is nothing to say about college or higher education. It just says near age. And so a near age person could be 16. A near age person could be 60. It doesn't matter. And so schooling isn't required either. The place where the schooling comes in is strictly uh, within the, the campus that is being served. And if there are students who are doing that, yes. If they are not students, why can't they talk with other students who are just like, this college thing is kind of whack. I don't believe in this. Like, why am I going to spend $80,000 for this when I can go build my own mechanic shop, which is a genuinely good idea if my drive is for that, right? So someone needs someone to hear that and to say that to them. I also have one other question. Um, so are you... What population are you serving? Is it only in the schools where you are, um, your uh, peers, peer supporters are providing services or are you, um, specifically, are you in Travis County Juvenile Justice? Because um, I think there's a really big need for um, youth peer supporters or near age peer supporters in the 
Juvenile Justice Center? So thank you for that question um, because it allows me to kind of get into my criticisms of what peer support looks like right now. So I've come across a lot of different youth peer support programs that have been failing like no other. Like the facilitators just drop out, uh, there's not constant attendance, so on and so forth. And I believe that is because they try to go too far too fast. When it comes to the one-to-one -one mentoring for our peer support specialists, they don't do that until at least solid two, three months of observation. And then they can do some one-to-one, -one, so to speak, I'm just still there or a navigator is still there and we have permission from the other peer to do that. Uh, or they can come along with me when I go to one of my visits or one of my mentoring services, things like that. So going outside of the college ecosystem means I'm now trying to spread myself too thin. But now if I'm taking my time and building capacity, that is exactly where we want to go. But when we're ready. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Berlene. Um, I'm here with MPDA um, nonprofit organization. And my question is, how do you show support to someone um, that knows that they suffer from mental illnesses? Um, and instead of actually seeking help, they're like, okay, you know that I suffer from this, so just deal with it. How do you support them? How do you continue to help, help them if they don't want the help themselves? It's just like, you know this is it. You, this, you know this is why I'm acting this way, so just accept it. Uh, so I can speak from personal experience on that one. Uh, in that I've had that mindset several times, even when I got to my space of, oh, I got this, I'm doing so great. Oh, but you know, I'm just bipolar too. Oh no, I just ADHD, it's just gonna keep happening until I realized that the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Health Disorders, like that entire thing has been put out five times, five different times, meaning that there have been five changes. I used to be called manic depressive. <laughs> All it is, is a series of observations done over a period of time. My question is who makes those observations? Who decides what a diagnosis entails? Even within bipolar disorders, uh, there's unspecific or unspecified because they see some stuff, but they can't say it just enough to put it in these categories. And so I, and I, the reason why I include that is because the understanding that there is always a re-understanding waiting around the corner. And so for me, it was, I had to switch from this mindset of, I'm gonna take that word had to back. I don't have to do anything. No one has a string pulling me up out of bed. No one's making me pay my taxes. No one's making me put gas in my car. I make the choice to do that or I make the choice not to, right? And so I can make the choice to identify with this observation that somebody else made or I can choose to identify myself by what I've accomplished. And so I would say that for me, I needed to see that modeled. I needed to see someone who was identifying themselves by their own terms. That was my cousin, Jody. Jody gives zero, you know, whereas I'm looking for her, about what anybody else thinks. She never had kids. She had all the jobs that she wanted. She drove a truck. She opened a bar. She worked for Panasonic. She and she never showed any sadness. She never showed, and I'm not saying she didn't feel it, but I had that to watch and you know, that's how I learned it. And so maybe if that is something that speaks to you and that would work for them, then give it a shot. Take care of ourselves, right? Be the example, be the model. But how do you, do that when you're being dragged down with them like how do you put yourself in that element mm -hmm. you know of actually saying okay I, yeah I, I know you have this issue I'm accepting that I'm accepting you for who you are but how do you do it how do you just say okay I'm just gonna sit here and take it or do you I mean is how do you approach them like how do you say okay yeah this is your issue and then saying but this is then it turns into like an argument then it's mm -hmm. kind of like a debate on so 
like what's the solution? So since I don't have that direct experience, I can get some thoughts, yeah. but I wanna see if there's some actual direct experiences first. Um, I, so I, Erica, again, I do have some direct experience with that. I have a daughter who um, has a diagnosis with mental health and that sounds very much, what you described sounds very much like um, uh, some of the behavior and symptoms that my, my daughter exhibits. Um, for me, the important thing is um, setting really good healthy boundaries for myself. Um, because I, she's her own person. She's going to have her own recovery journey. Um, if that's what she chooses, I can model, um, healthy, positive behaviors and recovery behaviors for her. And, um, I can set my own boundaries and, um, and I can be real clear in my language and just, um, say, look, I, I love you. This is something that I'm not okay with. I, I, I cannot handle it when you, when you speak this way to me. Um, we need to separate for a little bit and then we can come back and try to have an, a, a quieter conversation, but I can't handle the yelling. I can't handle the slamming of doors and all the crazy act, uh, uh, not crazy, but the, the um, high intensity emotions that, that happen. And so, yeah, just protecting myself and, and practicing a lot of self-care is, is um, helpful for me. And so that genuinely reminds me about how there's this ideal of empathy. There's this ideal of empathetic communication. Oh yeah, we just have that, this inner peace and I just have to be able to accept. And it's just like, uh-uh, I'm a human. I got feelings, you know? I, it's not that easy. I can't just shut it off by putting a different word in a different place. It's where that judgment of it comes in now. Because if I can understand that I am a human and I can also understand that there's this logical part about it, then I can give myself the grace to figure out what I can do that works for me. It's about, for me, understanding all those different elements. And so this right here is exactly what, A, educated empathy is supposed to be about, and also this peer support program and being a model. I am a facilitator. That's it. The group is the leader. I don't teach anything. I give a space that is conducive to learning either about a subject or about oneself or both. And so that is why I say for these programs, we cannot be the experts. All we can do is be the model. If I speak a certain way that shows I respect myself and I am doing this, then someone says, oh, that looks kind of cool. I, I'll mimic that. Healthy behaviors. Empathy is kind of dope. Hi, my name is Jody, and I have a nonprofit, Teens Grounded in Victoria, Texas. Um, and we have a, a youth leadership program where we work with junior high and high school students. One of the things we've really been working on is how to build empathy uh, within our junior high and high school students. Um, I understand that there's been a lot of trauma the last few years, and maybe that's kind of created some numbness there as far as you know having empathy for others. But I was just wondering if you had any kind of curriculum or anything that you use to build empathy with young students. Uh, yo, yes, I do. And I would definitely love to talk with you about that uh, you know, later, even right after this. And the information that I can give in general is that the curriculum is very much individualized based on the group. So it's like, what is the culture of the space? Uh, what is the community? What are those communities needs? What really made that stand out to me was coming from Philadelphia down here to Texas, where in Philly we have, and honest to God, on like the East Coast and South in general, we have a certain narrative of the civil rights movement. We have a certain narrative of what race looks like in America. And so we see nothing but the same images. We see the buses, we see the dogs, we see the fires, we see all of that. And then when I came down here and I saw that there was like five of me and everybody else came from a different cultural background but the same messaging was still being used, it created this division of understanding and then animosity. Because now it's, we're being told that that's what racism is or that's what bigotry is, or that's what sexism is. And it's not actually what I'm seeing. And so to try to say that there is a genuine, I'm sorry, a general 
curriculum for it? Nope, because that would be disrespecting the community, right? That is looking to build that. And so rather, there are a lot to do with being focused around what's happening in this room right now, with the questions, uh, empathy building is a lot about light bulb moments, like, oh, ooh, yeah, okay, that makes sense now. The way they did that, the way they made me feel, it all makes sense. That comes from conversation with purpose. It comes from, it does come from activities. It can be built on through purposeful direction. Uh, it is also something that exists outside of the classroom, so to speak. It's a communal thing. It's an art. It could be whatever it is that's needed in that community. So whatever your unique community is, I want to respect that. Deep you know? rural South Texas. <laughs> I got to get down because I haven't actually been there yet. So I've been kind of stuck in Austin for a minute. I got to visit. Thank you for that question. All right. So I see we're wrapping up now. I just want to say thank you so much for the questions and the engagement and the head nods and the, just the straight up energy because I needed that to get me in the center. This stuff is all about me too. I'm selfish. I hope you all are too. Thank you. <laughs>